Welcome, Smarties. We have a new book to start today, and I've switched locations. Um, I also have a fun friend here I'll show you. Hi, buddy. My dog is here to listen. He's excited. <laughs> um, so we are going to start a new book today. We're going to start the book Holes. Um, and the chapters are short, so I'm going to read more than one chapter today. So here we go. <laughs> what is it, buddy, huh? All right. Part one. You are entering Camp Green Lake. Chapter one. There is no lake at Camp Green Lake. There once was a very large lake here, the largest lake in Texas. That was over a hundred years ago. Now it's just dry, flat wasteland. There used to be a town of Green Lake as well. The town shriveled up and dried up along with the lake and the people who lived there. During the summer, the daytime temperature hovers around 95 degrees in the shade, if you can find any shade. There's not much shade in the big dry lake. The only trees are two old oaks at the eastern edge of the lake. A hammock is stretched between the two trees and a log cabin stands behind that. The campers are forbidden to lie in the hammock. It belongs to the warden. The warden owns the shade. Out on the lake, rattlesnakes and scorpions find shade under rocks and in holes dug by the campers. Here's a good rule to remember about rattlesnakes and scorpions. If you don't bother them, they won't bother you, usually. Being bitten by a scorpion or even a rattlesnake is not the worst thing that can happen to you. You won't die, usually. Sometimes the camper will try to be bitten by a scorpion or even a rattlesnake. Then he will spend a day or two recovering in his tent instead of having to dig a hole out in the lake. But you don't want to be bitten by a yellow spotted lizard. That's the worst thing that can happen to you. You will die a slow and painful death always. If you get bitten by a yellow spotted lizard, you might as well go into the shade of the oak trees and lie in the hammock. There's nothing anyone can do to you anymore. Chapter two. The reader is probably asking, why would anyone want to go to Camp Green Lake? Most campers weren't given a choice. Camp Green Lake is a camp for bad boys. If you take a bad boy and make him dig a hole every day in the hot sun, it will turn him into a good boy. That was what some people thought. Stanley Yelnats was given a choice. The judge said, you may go to jail or you may go to Camp Green Lake. Stanley was from a poor family. He had never been to camp before. Chapter three. Stanley Yelnats was the only passenger on the bus, not counting the driver or the guard. The guard sat next to the driver with his seat turned around facing Stanley and a rifle lay across his lap. Stanley was sitting about 10 rows back, handcuffed to his armrest. His backpack lay on the seat butt next to him. The, it contained his toothbrush, toothpaste, and a box of stationery his mother had given him. He had promised to write her at least once a week. He looked out the window, though there wasn't much to see, mostly fields of hay and cotton. He was on a long bus ride to nowhere, and the bus wasn't air conditioned, and the hot, heavy air was almost sti as stifling as the handcuffs. Stanley and his parents had tried to pretend that he was just going away to camp for a while, just like rich kids do. When Stanley was younger, he used to play with his stuffed animals and pretend the animals were at camp. Camp fun and games, he called it. Sometimes he'd have them play soccer with a marble. Other times, they'd run an obstacle course or go bungee jumping off the table, tied to broken rubber bands. Now Stanley tried to pretend that he was going to camp fun and games. Maybe he'd make some friends, he thought. At least he'd get to swim in the lake. He didn't have friends at home. He was overweight and the kids at his middle school often teased him about his size. Even his teachers sometimes made cruel comments without realizing it. On his last day, his math teacher, Mrs. Bell, taught ratios. As an example, she chose the heaviest kid in class and the lightest kid in class and had them weigh themselves. Stanley weighed three times as much as the other boy. Miss Bell wrote the ratio on the board, three to one, unaware of how much embarrassment she had caused both of them. 
Stanley was arrested later that day. He looked at the guard who sat slumped in the seat and wondered if he had fallen asleep. The guard was wearing sunglasses, so Stanley couldn't see his eyes. Stanley was not a bad kid. He was innocent of the crime which he was convicted. He had been in the wrong place at the wrong time. It was all because, because of his no good, dirty, rotten, pig stealing great great grandfather. He smiled. It was a family joke. Whenever anything went wrong, they always blamed Stanley's no good, dirty, rotten, pig stealing great great grandfather. Supposedly, he had a great great grandfather who had stolen a pig from a one legged gypsy, and she put a curse on him and all his descendants. Stanley and his parents didn't believe in curses, of course, but whenever anything went wrong, it felt good to be able to blame someone. Things went wrong a lot. They always seemed to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. He looked out the window at the vast emptiness. He watched the rise and fall of the telephone wire, and in his mind, he could hear his father's gruff voice singing softly, if only, if only the woodpecker sighs, the bark of the tree was a little bit softer, while the wolf waits below, hungry and lonely. He cries to the moon, if only, if only. It was a song his father used to sing to him. The melody was sweet and sad, but Stanley's favorite part when his father would howl the word moon. The bus, the bus hit a small bump and the guard sat up instantly alert. Stanley's father was an inventor. To be a successful inventor, you need three things, intelligence, perseverance, and just a little bit of luck. Stanley's father was smart and he had a lot of perseverance. Once he started a project, he would work on it for years, often going days without sleep. He just never had any luck. Every time an experiment failed, Stanley could hear him cursing his dirty, rotten, pig-stealing great-grandfather. Stanley's father was also named Stanley Yelnats. Stanley's father's full name was Stanley Yelnats III. Our Stanley is Stanley Yelnats IV. Everyone in his family had always liked the fact that Stanley Yelnats was spelled the same frontward and backward. So they kept naming their son Stanley. Stanley was an only child and as was every other Stanley Yelnats before him. All of them had something else in common. Despite their awful look, they always remained hopeful. As Stanley's father liked to say, I learn from failure. But perhaps that, that was part of the curse as well. If Stanley and his father weren't always hopeful, then it wouldn't hurt so much every time their hopes were crushed. Not every Stanley Yelnats had been a failure. Stanley's mother often pointed out, whenever Stanley or his father became discouraged, they actually started, and they actually started believing in the curse. The first Stanley Yelnats, Stanley's great grandfather, had made a fortune in the stock market. He couldn't have been too unlucky. At such times, she neglected to mention that the bad luck that befell the first Stanley Yelnats, he lost his entire fortune, and when he mo was moving from New York to California, his stagecoach was robbed by the outlaw Kissin' Kate Barlow. If it weren't for that, <clears throat> Stanley's family would now be living in a mansion on a beach in California. Instead, they were crammed in a tiny apartment that smelled of burning rubber and foot odor. If only, if only. The apartment smelled the way it did because Stanley's father was trying to invent a way to recycle old sneakers. The first person who finds a use for old sneakers, he said, will be a very rich man. It was his late, latest project that led Stanley to Stanley's arrest. The bus ride became increasingly bumpy because the road was no longer paved. Actually, Stanley had been very impressed when he first found out that his great-grandfather was robbed by Kiss and Kate Barlow. True, he would have preferred living on a beach in California, but it was still kind of cool to have someone in your family robbed by a famous outlaw. Kate Barlow didn't actually kiss Stanley's great-grandfather. That would have been really cool, but she only kissed the men she killed. Instead, she robbed him and left him stranded in the middle of the desert. He was lucky to survive, his mother was quick to point out. The bus slowed down. The guard grunted as he stretched his arms. Welcome to Camp Green Lake, said the driver. Stanley looked out the dirty window. He couldn't see a lake and hardly anything was green. 
All right, we will read another chapter, chapter four. Stanley felt somewhat dazed as the guard unlocked his handcuffs and let him off the bus. He had been on the bus for over eight hours. Be careful, the bus driver said as Stanley walked down the steps. Stanley wasn't sure if the bus driver meant for him to be careful going down the steps or if he was telling him to be careful at Camp Green Lake. Uh, thanks for the ride, he said. His mouth was dry and his throat hurt. <clears throat> he stepped onto the hard, dry dirt. There was a band of sweat around his wrists where the handcuffs had been. The land was barren and desolate. He could see a few rundown buildings and some tents. Further away, there was a cabin beneath two tall trees. Those two tall trees were the only plant life he could see. There weren't even weeds. The guard led Stanley to a small building. On a sign on front said, you are entering Camp Green Lake, juvenile correction facility. Next to it was another sign which declared that it was a violation of the Texas Penal Code to bring guns, explosives, weapons, drugs, or alcohol onto the premises. As Stanley read the sign, he couldn't help but think, well, duh. The guard led Stanley into the building where he felt a welcome relief of air conditioning. The man was sitting up with his feet on, on a desk and he turned his head when Stanley and the guard entered, but otherwise didn't move. Even though he was inside, he wore sunglasses and a cowboy hat. He also held a can of soda and the sight of it made Stanley even more aware of his own thirst. He waited while the bus guard gave the man some papers to sign. That's a lot of sunflower seeds, the bus guard said. Stanley noticed a burlap sack filled with sunflower seeds on the floor next to the desk. I quit smoking last month, said the man in the cowboy hat. He had a tattoo of a rattlesnake on his arm, and as he signed his name, the rattlesnake seemed to wiggle. I used to smoke a pack a day, and now I eat a sack of these every week, the guard laughed. There must have been some small refrigerator behind his desk because the man in the cowboy hat produced two more cans of soda. For a second, Stanley hoped that one might be for him, but the man gave one to the guard and said the other was for the driver. Nine hours, and now nine hours back, said the guard grumbled. What a day. Stanley thought about how lo the long bus ride felt, and he felt a little sorry for the guard and the bus driver. The man in the cowboy hat spit sunflower seeds shells into the waste paper basket, and then he walked around the desk to Stanley. My name is Mr. Sir, he said. Whenever you speak to me, you must call me by my name. Is that clear? Stanley hesitated. Uh, yes, Mr. Sir, he said, though he couldn't imagine that that was the, really the man's name. You're not in the Girl Scouts anymore, Mr. Sir said. Stanley had to remove his clothes in front of Mr. Sir, who made sure he wasn't hiding anything. When he was given two sets of clothes and a towel, each set consisted of long sleeve orange jumpsuit, an orange t-shirt, and yellow socks. Stanley wasn't sure if the socks had been yellow originally. He had also given him white sneakers, an orange cap, and a canteen made of heavy plastic, which unfortunately was empty. The cap had a piece of cloth sewn on the back of it for neck, neck protection. Stanley got dressed. The clothes smelled like soap. S Mr. Sir told him that he should wear one set to work in and the other set for relaxation. Laundry was done every three days. On that day, his work clothes would be washed and the other set would become his work clothes and he would get the clean clothes to wear while resting. You are to dig hole, one hole each day, including Saturdays and Sundays. Each hole must be five feet deep and five feet across in every direction. Your shovel is your measuring stick. Breakfast is served at 4.30. Stanley must have looked surprised because Mr. Sir went on to explain that they had started too early to avoid the hottest part of the day. No one is going to babysit you. The longer it takes you to dig, the longer you'll be out in the sun. If you dig up anything interesting, you are to report it to me or any counselor. When you're finished, the rest of the day is yours. Stanley nodded to show he understood. This isn't a Girl Scout camp, said Mr. Sir. He checked Stanley's backpack and allowed him to keep it. Then he led Stanley outside into the blazing heat. Take a good look around you. What do you see? Stanley looked out across the vast wasteland. The air seemed thick with heat and dirt. Not much, he said, and then he hastily added, uh, Mr. Sir. Mr. Sir laughed. Do you see any guard towers? No. How about electric fences? No, Mr. Sir. 
Is there a, no fence at all, is there? No, Mr. Sir. You want to run away? Mr. Sir asked him. Stanley looked back at him, unsure what he meant. If you want to run away, go ahead, start running. I'm not going to stop you. Stanley didn't know what kind of games Mr. Sir was playing. I see you're looking at my gun. Don't worry, I'm not going to shoot you, he tapped his holster. This is for yellow-spotted lizards. I wouldn't waste a bullet on you. I'm not going to run away, Stanley said. Good thinking. Nobody runs away from here. We don't need a fence. Know why? Because we've only we've got the only water for a hundred miles. You run want to run away? You'll be buzzard food in three days. Stanley could see some kids dressed in orange carrying shovels, dragging them themselves towards the tents. Are you thirsty? Yes, sir, Mr. Stanley said gratefully. Well, you better get used to it. You're going to be thirsty for the next 18 months. Okay, so that is the start of holes. I want you to start thinking about what you know about Stanley, make some predictions. They didn't tell you a ton about why he's there yet. All right, we'll see you tomorrow.